take some questions. We may take some questions. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can speak out. Uh, we will not take your questions. So I, I enjoy being interactive. Uh, now let's talk about the proof for evolution. But before we go into the discussion of the proof for evolution, let's talk about what evolution is. So how do you understand what evolution is? Uh, please do not worry. I will not grade you. OK? I will not assess you in any way manner or fashion, okay? What we are trying to do is to have a meaningful discussion, I'm sorry, that will benefit us all. You will learn something from me, and I will learn something from you, and those who are uh, homeschooling students who are not a part of this class, you're welcome to participate, to ask questions. So you have full right, the full rights here, okay? Uh, so don't be afraid to give me a wrong answer. Uh, I am not looking for the right answers. I'm looking for any answers. Because I'm trying to see what you think, how you understand things, even how you feel about things. That's all going to be valuable to me. So relax. Don't be afraid of giving a wrong answer or something, or something I do not expect from you. Just talk to me, okay? So how do you understand the word evolution when you when you use it. Okay. So um, one way to talk about evolution is to see people coming from apes. So evolution is the transformation of apes into people. Okay, and this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. And I will talk about why this is not true, how we can know scientifically that it's not true. I will not be talking about the evolution from the Bible, but only from what we know about the world around us. Okay, but there is an interesting question. If people came from the apes, where did the apes come from? Where they come from? According to the theory of evolution, yes. Uh, they came from dinosaurs. I am not sure that they are directly related according to the evolutionary theory. Uh, modern scientists believe that birds came from dinosaurs. Uh, but where did monkeys, where did the apes come from? from early mammals, excellent. And what would that early mammal look like? Yeah, dog-like, rodent-like. And where did that come from, according to them? Okay, okay, they came from fish. And where did the fish come from? Organism. Uh, maybe worms of some kind, right? Uh, and where did the worms come from? Okay, let, let me make it very scientific from... Uh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. We'll get there. <laughs> but they came from single-celled organisms, okay? And where did the single-celled organisms come from? Yeah, uh, actually, I'll get there, but not yet. Uh, they believe that the single-celled organisms came from organic molecules like DNA, RNA, proteins, okay? And where did the organic molecules come from? Here's, here's your question, Dirk. So they believe 
maybe the, the theory of evolution that we're going to try to debunk uh, says that the life appeared all by itself, by random chance, through random chance events or events on this planet. And then that initial simple life was becoming more and more complex over time. The first single-celled organisms became worms, worms became fish, the fish became uh, apes, and apes became people. So this is what we will understand when we will be using the word evolution. Because there are some other definitions of evolution which are very good. For example, evolution can be uh, used to describe a development of a city. A city started from a uh, few buildings, a parking lot, a church, and then it evolved into a beautiful megapolis. So uh, we can talk about the evolution of a writer's style, for example, and we can talk about evolution in biology too. Yes, for example, some biologists say that evolution is change in groups of organisms, in populations of organisms over time, from generation to generation. And if we use the word evolution in that sense, it is true, because animals do change from one generation to uh, the next generation. And I'll give you several examples of that. Yes, ma'am. There are different, there are different, yes, you're right, you're right. Uh, this is what some people call microevolution or limited evolution, and I have nothing against those usages of the word evolution. They are, uh, they are legitimate, we, we can use them, we can really use them. However, the problem arises when people show us such changes in living organisms that take place over several generations, and they say that the same kind of changes can transform dirt into single-celled organisms, single-celled organisms into worms and into fish, into monkeys and people. That is where the problem is. So let's be very careful. We're talking about the idea that people came from apes. Now, there are about nine or 10 major proofs that you may encounter uh, in magazines, in textbooks, in schools, in TV shows. And let's start with proof number one. Those who believe in evolution, and I will be calling them evolutionists. There is nothing bad about this word. This is not a slander, this is not a derogatory term. I'll just call people who believe in evolution, evolutionists. Yes. Uh, where did dirt come from? They would say it came from uh, Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Where did Big Bang come from? Exactly. If we go far back into the past, uh, you've got to have matter, you've got to have time, you've got to have space, you've got to have energy at least to have the Big Bang. And where did that come from? They would say it's eternal. Yeah, it always existed, they would say. But I'm sorry, if it always existed, it means they believe in the eternal thing. <laughs> we believe in the eternal God, and they believe in the eternal mass, energy, uh, matter, energy, and time. So it's, it's faith, also it's religion, it's not science, believing in, in the eternal thing. So, uh, proof number one, they say, Living organisms change over time from generation to generation, and that proves evolution. And this proof uh, consists of two parts. First of all, they say that something like mutations create new organs and new structures in living things. So they say mutations make new organs. Mutations are necessary for a fish to grow out legs. And secondly, they say natural selection is necessary 
to work on those mutations. When do mutations happen? When new organs appear, when legs uh, grow out, the natural selection takes that mutation and keeps it, preserves it, makes sure that that good mutation passes to the next generations. And then those good mutations add up, they build up in organisms and in the end of this process of mutations plus natural selection, we have new organs and structures, new kinds of organs. So let's talk about mutations first. So mutations happen in our genes. Uh, to be more precise, uh, mutations happen in those parts uh, of our bodies, in those molecules that we pass on to our children, but we can say simply that mutations take place in our genes. But what is a mutation? Mutation, by definition, scientifically, is a copying error. So mutations are copying errors. Just imagine, you copy something, and when, when you copy something, you can copy it either perfectly or imperfectly. When you copy something perfectly, there is no change. But if you copy something imperfectly, you lose information, you corrupt information, you scramble information. Nothing good can come out of it. And actually, evolutionists believe that yes, the majority of the mutations, 99.99% of all mutations are harmful and lethal, but there are some mutations they will say that are good or beneficial. But actually, this is how you can disprove the idea of beneficial mutations. Simply go to a store and buy a pack of papers. Then take a good original picture, uh, take a magazine, uh, or take a page you printed on a good quality printer. Then go to a copying machine, put the original on top of the copying machine, make a copy, then throw the original away. Then take the copy, put it on top of the copying machine, make a copy, throw the original away. Take the copy, put it on top of the copying machine, and do it until you run out of paper. So what will happen to that picture? Something like that? Uh, it would be even more disturbing if I told you uh, what the inscription says under this face. Uh, on the left, on, on, on the left. Uh, it comes from Russia. I come from Russia. My wife comes from Ukraine. We're a mixed family. But this comes from Russia. And a lot of people love to put that picture uh, on their door just for a joke, and there is an inscription under there. It says, uh, your coming creates in us, in us a feeling of unspeakable joy. So your visit creates in us the feeling of an unspeakable joy. So go away. <laughs> On the so what happened to the picture? And on the right, it's a photograph from a passport, copied several times. Yeah, yeah, that's a passport quality photo, copied several times. So did the image become better or worse because of copying? It became worse. There are black dots where there should be white dots, and there are white dots where there should be black dots. Lines are wavy, the information was corrupted, and this is what is happening in our bodies. This is what mutations do. They will not do any good for us. Now, here's another example. Imagine you've got a perfectly clean skin and nothing stuck happening. I don't know who plays the piano, but who will not be fiddling either. 
Oh, let's imagine a piano that's perfectly tuned, and we take a tone deaf blind person and give him an instrument for changing the tension of the string. And we take that person by hand to the piano and ask him to change randomly the tension of the string. I see some of you smiling. Uh, I almost graduated from a musical school myself. I know what tuning an instrument is. But tell me something, will the piano stay perfectly tuned? Never, never. And will that person be able, if he continues doing that until he's 158 years old, if he continues doing that, will he be able to return the instrument into the perfect tune again by random chance? Not a chance. Mutations will not create anything good. Mutations destroy previously existing information. They are copying errors. What happens in genetics? By the way, these are real people. Mom and dad and their two twin daughters. I'll be talking about the origin of the human so-called races tonight in church. So I'll be using this picture as well. But what happens in genetics? In genetics, we take the existing information, Papa and Mama. We copy Papa and Mama, and we pass the information in new combinations of information onto next generations. That's why, because that information is passed on in new combinations. That's why the children resemble their parents, but they do not like they do not look exactly like their parents. And we may say, oh yeah, uh, these daughters have their father's chin, their mother's eyes, etc." Okay, so this is what happens in genetic. genetic uh, genetics, it protects existing information. The laws of genetics are conservative. They are not creative. They are not meant to make something new but to protect whatever already exists. And a good example, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, very good question. Uh, and we started off with it. Where did the original information come from? So we talked about the origins of people, apes, and dirt, and energy, and matter. But information has to come from an intelligence, from an intelligent creature. Only an intelligent creature is able to create information. And no evolutionary theory, no evolutionary believing scientist is able to answer this simple question. Where did the original information come from? The information that is now being copied and passed from mama, papa, to the children. Where did it come from in the beginning? And we say that the information always comes from an intelligent creature. So God created the information. In the beginning was the information. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the information. So uh, a great example of the scientist's attempt to study good mutations would be the fruit fly. So the fruit fly, for decades, been the favorite pet uh, testing animal of the geneticists. And the geneticists learned to create all sorts of mutations in the fruit flies. Over 3,000 different mutations were studied, discovered, and documented. However, the fruit flies, after over a hundred years of genetic experiments, they remained just fruit flies. I'll give you several examples of the mutations that take place in them. For example, there are mutations that make their wings curly. Some mutations make them wingless. They lose their wings because of certain mutations. And those flies cannot fly. So how do you call a fly that cannot fly? A walk or a crawl? 
for a hop. Uh, there are mutations, weird mutations that scientists can produce. Uh, those mutations make legs grow out where their antenna should be. On the left, you can see a normal fruit fly with antennas between the sides, right here. These are actual photographs. I pulled them from the internet. So these are not fakes. These doesn't come from a Marvel studio series. And then uh, fruit fly and man cross. No, no. On the right, you can see that instead of the antenna, instead of the antenna, two more legs grew out. That's a mutation. But is this mutation good for the fly? Is it better off because of this mutation? Mutations are bad. There is a specific mutation which can produce uh, about a dozen eyes all over the fly's body. That looks crazy, doesn't it? And uh, looks like it's doing everything. But those eyes cannot see because they're not hooked up to the brain. Those eyes. Uh, do not allow it to fly, to function normally. And because of those eyes, no normal fly will mate with it. So is the fly better off because of this mutation? No, we, we see mutations like in the ant man, maybe he's getting bitten by a spider, and he goes, ah, oh, you can do all sorts of things. But those are fantasies. We like, we enjoy fantasies, fairy tales, books, entertaining movies, sometimes with caution under the parental supervision. But still, uh, we enjoy the fantasy, but they are fantasy, they're bad. So in 2010, an article was published in the Nature magazine. That's the top science magazine for evolutionists in the world. Uh, when you want to get a higher standing or a higher ranking in the academic or scientific world, uh, you've got to publish your articles, your research in two magazines, in Nature and in Science. So Nature is the top level scientific magazine. And they reported back in 2010 uh, on 29 years of genetic ex experimentations on the fruit flies. And they said that they experimented over 600 generations, but in spite of all they did, fruit fly never changed into anything else. So the fruit flies remain fruit flies. That's what we see in nature. There are mutations, but they are harmful. They are lethal, uh, lethal. and organisms just remain what they are. The living organisms are surprisingly stable. Now, let's talk about the second part of this argument. I told you that first mutation must arise in living organisms, and then natural selection is to work on those mutations, preserving those which are beneficial, which are good, passing them on, building them up to produce new organisms, structures to produce new kinds of living creatures. And a lot of people, when they hear, I mean Christian people, when they hear the term natural selection, they become naturally suspicious. Because uh, in our mind, uh, there is an, an inseparable connection between the natural selection idea and Charles Darwin, isn't it? When we hear natural selection, we remember Charles Darwin, okay? However, Natural selection is not an idea that first came to Charles Darwin or to any other evolutionist. Because the idea of natural selection was invented, I might say, by creation believing scientists. William Edward Bly, 24 years uh, before 
Darwin published his Origin of Species, came up with the idea of natural selection. And William Edward White was a cre creation believing scientist, and he said that natural selection does work in nature. This is a reality. But what does it do? It conserves the species, the kinds of organisms. It removes the defective organisms. For example, organisms with harmful mutations in them. Uh, so it removes defective organisms and keeps the species pure and strong. This is what natural selection does, uh, Blythe said. However, Darwin later, in his famous book, The Origin of Species, published in 1859 for the first time, he came up with an idea that natural selection actually drives evolution. That natural selection is the thing which transformed the simplest organism into a worm, uh, into fish, into apes, and then into people. So that was his invention. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of how natural selection works in nature. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about uh, the peppered moths. Uh, the story about the pepper moths goes like this. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution in England, they were burning a lot of coal. That wasn't very healthy, and that darkened the bark of the trees. And because some moths were lighter colored, birds saw them first, because they stood out against the darker background of the tree trunk. Uh, so they were illuminated first. They died, died out first. And only those darker colored moths remained. And over time, uh, as a result of natural selection, the population or populations of moths, peppered moths, became mostly dark. So the environment selected the darker moths. It preserved the darker moths because the darker coloration was beneficial for survival. However, they did not change structure. The moths became nothing else but moths. Another example comes from Darwin's research itself. Uh, when he came during his voyage on the HMS Beagle around the world, when he came to the Galapagos Islands, he observed there several varieties of birds, and those birds are commonly called Darwin's finches right now. And he observed and collected those birds, and interestingly, their beaks were thicker and stronger on some islands. And on other islands, they were thinner and longer. And Dar uh, Darwin studied the environment, and he found out that the, the shape of the beaks is somehow linked to the food sources of those birds. On those islands where the birds had thicker and stronger beaks, the main food source were some hard seeds ground. So the birds needed stronger beaks to crush those seeds to get to, to the food. However, on those islands where the main food source were cactus fruit, the beaks were longer and thinner because that made feeding easier on the birds. You can get a fruit from a cactus easier if you have a longer beak. See? So he came up with a bright idea. He said that probably initially just one pair or several pairs of finches came to the islands from South America. And then over time, as a result of natural selection, several varieties of these birds developed. That was one of the arguments for his theory of natural selection. And this is good research. This is a good observation. This is a great idea. And we cannot blame Darwin 
for this idea because it's valid. And creation theory scientists agree that this is probably what can happen. So we don't argue against that. However, here comes the problem. Charles Darwin took this idea of the tree and he expanded it. Uh, taking this finch tree as a pattern, Darwin suggested that all organisms on the planet are the descendants of one most primitive organism. The idea is that what happens among those birds can be expanded and applied to the whole natural world. That is where the problem is. He called them Monera, actually not him, but his disciple or Heckel. But uh, this tree was not uh, drawn by Darwin himself. This tree of life was drawn by Ernst Heckel. Darwin did have some form of the tree of life in his works, in his sketches, but it's very schematic, very simplified. But the elaborate version came from Ernst Heckel, and we will talk more about him if we have time today. Uh, and this idea of the tree of life is uh, still alive and kicking. And you can see it illustrated in many different ways uh, in different uh, textbooks. Okay, so let's talk about this. When we say, when we say as Christians, as scientists who believe in creation, when we say we do not believe in evolution, what do we mean? This is very important. What do we mean when we say we don't believe in evolution? And even more, even more important is what do people who hear us say? What do they think we mean? Okay. What do they think we mean? When we say we do not believe in evolution from apes to people, from single-celled organisms to worms, and on to fish, we deny the existence of the single tree of life. This is what we do not believe in. However, people, when they hear that we deny evolution, they think that we deny obvious observable facts. And they think we're crazy because of this. And this is very important. Uh, when you talk to someone about evolution, about the origins, it's very important to know exactly what you are talking about. This is, this is what we discussed, Pastor, during lunchtime. It's very important to know the meaning of the word you use and your uh, friend uses. So we deny the single tree of life. However, we do not deny the facts. The facts are obvious. And actually, actually, natural, this natural selection thing is an important part of the creation model. This is how. This is how it works. We know that only Noah, uh, his family members, ate and all, including and only those animals and birds that were on board the ark, only they survived the great flood in Noah's day. So what happened after the flood? After the flood, those animals got off the ark. And one pair of horses, from them came all the modern horses that look different that are very different from each other, but still are representative of the same horse kind. So zebras are horses, and Clydesdales, huge horses, are horses, and ponies, little tiny ponies, they are all the same horse kind. So obviously, organisms change over time from generation to generation. And if we mean by evolution such changes within one created kind, like within the horse kind, such evolution can be observed. 
such evolution is true. Because it's written in the Bible about. This is how from one pair of horses from the ark, all modern horses, including zebras and ponies and clive fields, sprung. They are different. They are very different. Some are very big, some are very small, some are striped, others are not. But they're all horses, the same kind. And uh, the same goes for the dog kind from one pair of wolf-like or dog-like animals on the ark. We got all modern dogs that live today on, uh, on the planet. Dingoes, jackals, dogs, and coyotes, and wolves, and even foxes. Russian scientists proved about 10, 15 years ago that foxes are actually dogs. Creation scientists suspected that for many, many years, but it's been only recently proven. They can be tamed, foxes, and tame foxes behave exactly like all dogs do. You can keep them in your lap. You can pet them. Yeah. So foxes are dogs. They are so different. So evolution on a limited scale within this created kind of cats, we might say took place. We do not deny. However, you don't see half dogs, half horses, half dogs, half fish, half dogs, half monkeys, half dogs, half cats. Uh, I, I say it in very, in very simple terms. Of course, nobody expects to see here uh, a cross between dog and cat. I'm simplifying things. But these are different dogs, but they're all dogs. And the same goes for the cat. Do you know that you can... Uh, cross lions and tigers. Do you know that you can cross them all with each other? Only the mama and papa should be of comparable sizes. They should not be too different in size. You can cross all of them, going from one end of the spectrum to the other. I'll show you several examples. For example, this is Tigon. This is a cross between a male tiger and female lion, a lioness. Or you can get and cross a male jaguar with a lioness. You'll get a jaglion or a jag lion. Or you can cross a servile, a smaller wild cat uh, with a domestic cat. And you'll get this weird, weird looking mix. <laughs> but you, you, you can cross them. You can get uh, kidneys from them. And that means that they belong to the same created kind. Because this is the definition of the kind in the Bible. The kind reproduces after its own kind. If two animals can interbreed and produce living offspring, it means they are the same kind. So what do we see in nature? Do we see that single tree of life evolutionists talk about? No, we do not. However, we see many small trees. And we say as creationists that we have an orchard instead of a single tree of life. So natural selection, mutation, mutations are harmful. But some mutations do not kill uh, living organisms. Some mutations even help them survive. Uh, but still, it's destruction of information. But natural selection, mutations, they produce differences from generation to generation, but you will have only an orchard. You will never have uh, creatures from one kind becoming something else. So, so much about natural selection. Now let's talk about fossils. Uh, if you ever were interested in the teaching of evolution, you, uh, you saw something like this. My question is, did you? Did you see anything like this? So this is called a geochronologic column or a geochronologic chart. So the idea here is that the present time is at the top. And as you go down into the crust of the Earth, you go through various layers in the ground. 
they're called sedimentary layers, but basically sedimentary layers are layers of dried out rock, oh, sorry, dried out mud. That's dried out mud, if we explain it simply. <coughs> it's not that simple, of course, but simply saying these dried out mud layers uh, were given scientific names. You can see them, see them here on the left, like quaternary, tertiary, cretaceous, jurassic, like Jurassic Park movie. And if you go down to the beginning of the Cambrian, uh, from the present time back to the beginning of the Cambrian, it's supposed to be about 570 million years old. Okay. However, uh, let's talk about this idea. Um, doesn't the theory of evolution say that on average, generally, uh, organisms become bigger, better, faster, and smarter all the time? Don't they say that? Okay, bigger, better, smarter. One of the young people during the previous hour said better. Oh, maybe. We, we do become better initially, or naturally, yeah. So this is the general idea that living organisms become bigger, better, faster over time. However, if we study the fossils, what do we see? How large are your cockroaches? I live in Orlando, just two hours north. Our cockroaches uh, can be this big. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that Goliath of a cockroach in my kitchen. We have a wonderful house. We rent a house from a wonderful Christian uh, man, and it's very nicely sealed, and there are very few co uh, cockroaches that get into the house, maybe one or two a year, okay? But what do I do to them? I take my vacuum cleaner, and I vacuum them. I, I, I don't want to hit them. My wife has no qualms. She just comes and with her hand, she doesn't smash them. But I cannot do that. She's a medical worker. She's, uh, I take, I, I'm an engineer. By profession, I'm a nuclear power engineer. I did work a lot as a nuclear power engineer, but that's my training. So as an engineer, I take a vacuum and I come and I, however, when I saw that big one, I came to the, to the vacuum, uh, nothing. It wouldn't budge, it wouldn't move. I couldn't do anything to it. Then my wife came with a sleeper, <laughs> and then I vacuumed it. So in Russia, where I come from, they do not believe these stories because Russian and Ukrainian cockroaches are very big. <laughs> They're very small. But there are lots of them, <laughs> sometimes, especially in wooden houses. But evolution say that the organisms become bigger, better, smarter, faster over time. However, when we compare modern cockroaches to the fossil cockroaches, the fossil cockroaches can, uh, could grow to six and an eight inches long. Uh, this is dragonfly. The wingspan of this dragonfly is about six inches. However, the live dragonfly is sitting on top of a fossil dragonfly, which is much larger now, right? And there are dragonflies in the fossil record up to 36 inch in wingspan. That's right about there. Imagine you driving to Orlando on I-4 making, okay, you're good people, your parents are Christian people, 75 miles an hour, not 90, no, 75, 75 miles an hour, and there comes out this 36 inch dragonfly and smashes into your windshield. What's going to happen? Well, you will have a lot of car wash to do. <laughs> you, not your parents. And also, according to the theory of evolution, organisms change over time. And I gave an example 
uh, the absence of significant changes in the fruit fly, right? And evolutionists would counter that. They would say, of course, uh, we've been studying the fruit flies over 100 years. That's too short a period of time for any noticeable changes to take place. They say it takes millions of years uh, for organisms to be transformed from one kind into another kind. And let us look at several examples of what happens to living organisms over supposed millions of years, tens and even hundreds of millions of years. I'll tell you something, I do not believe in millions of years. I believe in the Bible, okay? There are scientific proofs that tell us that the Earth is young. It's several thousand years old as written in the Bible. But first of all, I believe the Bible, and the Bible says that the Earth and everything that fills the universe was created in six days. Right. And then there are genealogies from Adam to Abraham, and from Adam to Abraham, it was about, what, 2,000 years. Then 2,000 years, about 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus Christ, and about 2,000 years from Jesus Christ to us. Right. That gives us about 6,000 years of Earth's history. That's what I believe. However, evolutionists say that the Earth has existed for uh, four and a half to five billion years. They believe that organisms slowly evolved, as I showed you in that first chart, over hundreds of millions of years. So let's compare the creatures taken from, the, from different parts of the world living now and the organisms that come from various layers in the ground that they say were formed Billions, not billions, millions uh, of years before. So look at that. In the top picture, you see the top of the head of a small ant that lives now in Mexico. In the picture below, we see the same kind of ant in a piece of amber that was found in the Dominican Republic. And evolutionists believe that the Dominican ambers are somewhere between 25 and 40 million years old. However, do you see any changes between these two ants? Can you believe that no changes took place in 40 million years? I don't think so. I, I think there were no that's the simplest answer. Now, here is a fossil ginkgo leaf and um, live ginkgo leaves. Uh, can you see any more changes between the fossil leaf and the live leaf? Do they differ more from each other than any two leaves in a live tree? No, they don't. However, according to those who believe in evolution, these pictures are separated by 150 million years. So supposedly no changes, no significant changes took place in the ginkgo tree structure in 150 million years old. Where is evolution? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, now, let's look at the horseshoe crabs. These are four live horseshoe crabs alive today. They live along the shores and all the oceans virtually. And this is a fossil horseshoe crab. And back in 2008, evolutionists claimed that they found perfectly preserved horseshoe crabs that looked exactly like modern horseshoe crabs, but that were fossilized about 445 million years ago. Can you believe that? No evolution took place in 445 million years? No, I cannot believe that. Uh, they have an explanation for that. They say that these organisms reached such a stage in their evolution 445 million years ago, that they became virtually perfect for their environment 
and they did not need to change any more. So that's the explanation. They reached the perfect point. They became perfectly adapted, and they didn't have any need to be changed anymore. That's why they didn't evolve. However, I can show you a book. And by the way, I have a copy of that book with me. It's this thick, and it's full of pictures of fossil creatures and live creatures that are the same, just the same. A book this thick. And such fossils or such creatures are called living fossils. So you can see uh, on hundreds of examples, I think thousands, millions of examples, that creatures did not change significantly over time. There is a classical example, a chambered nautilus. Uh, the chambered nautiluses, they say, didn't change significantly in 180 million years. However, there's a slight problem with that. They used to grow to six feet, uh, six feet across. Now they are six inches across, generally speaking. So yes, structurally they didn't change, but did they become bigger, better, faster, smarter over time? No, they became smaller, slower, and dumber. Uh, this is believed to be the oldest fossil bat skeleton. It's believed to be 34 to 56 million years old. However, when we look at it, it looks exactly like the skeletons of modern bats. And this is the oldest bat we have. So throughout their whole recorded fossil history, they did not change significantly. We don't see any evolution at all. Now, let's look at some rocks. Can you tell me, uh, can you bend rock? Why? Because it's solid. I can tell you something. I study engineering. And engineers always test the materials they use. If you build a nuclear reactor, you want to, you want to be pretty sure that the material you're using <laughs> will hold that nuclear reaction inside, not let it outside. So there, there is equipment in special laboratories that study materials that can break anything. Steel, any grade of steel, uh, any stone, any rock, those machines will bend it and break it. So we, we, we have enough power in our machines to do that. But can you bend a rock? Uh, you cannot bend a rock because it will break, right? But you can bend it if it's a soft mud, right? Look at this, 35 layers of mud, they were laid down at the same time. And while they were still wet, because the earth was moving, the earth was unsettled, they were bent together. So those are mud layers formed during maybe a local flood. However, look at these layers. They were laid down at the same time, and while they were still wet, they were folded together because of the movement of the earth. And probably this comes from the flood of Noah. It was one huge flood that covered the whole earth about 4,500 years before. And this comes from Arizona. And I'll show you just one more picture that you will know that the flood really took place. These are the peaks of the British Columbian Rockies, British Columbia Rockies, yeah. Can you see any folding there? So the Rockies actually are nothing else but the layers of mud that were laid down by the great flood in the day of Noah. And then later they were folded and mountains were formed when the continents were moving. So the flood is a reality and the fossils that we find they are a result of the flood, not of evolution. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Pastor, please come on.
Newman is going to be speaking tonight in church about the Tower of Babel and where the races came from. How it is that, by the way, the word race is not a Bible word. We learned about some Bible words today. Amen. And uh, if you come tonight, you'll learn some more of those things. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you back to your classroom to get your stuff at 3 o'clock. Uh, get your belongings. I say Mr. Hall said some more church people. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, just, just one question. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Let me see your eyes. Did you enjoy it? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Bloom, if you want to try to respond in a couple of things, you talked about how the natural selection of the I can mute myself. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Is that okay? 